Good evening, afternoon, or morning, depending on what time you're listening to this, fellow listeners. I'm here with the new and improved FishCast. Now that we've got the name right properly, calling it the FishCast. My name is Corey Long. I'm here with the director of scouting and recruiting and all of the things with Elite Scouting Service, Charles Fishbein. How was your weekend, Charles? Yeah, very, a lot of fun, man. I enjoyed uh, the weekend, and you know, I'm excited about this podcast. We bring in an old friend to kind of come in and co-host and uh you know we don't get to you know well i saw demo a couple weeks ago maybe a month ago and uh through contract tracing we realized that uh demo uh you know did a little damage while he's down here you know oh boy (laughs) you guys you guys need to learn how to wear masks all right that's the bottom line his mask looked like girls panties man i ain't gonna lie this is why i stay home all the time (laughs) Yeah, I wonder why wasn't even a mask. Because of people like you is why I stay home all the time. Oh, exactly why it's like, even when you're wearing masks, the masks are basically made of tissue paper. Okay. <laughs> They're not gonna stop anything. They wouldn't st- they wouldn't stop, you know. <laughs> They're not gonna they wouldn't stop or sprinkle a spit, much less a germ. Okay, so come on, guys. <laughs> do better. Both of you do better. Uh, As I- Fish was saying. Yeah, we have uh, we have former uh, former coach uh, Chris Chris Damaris who coached at uh, North Carolina State, coached at Hawaii, coached at Rutgers, coach was a was a GA at Florida State, pretty much been all across the earth. As far as you can possibly go to play football, Chris Damaris has been there because he was in Hawaii, and I don't think you can go any further in the Pacific and play American football in Hawaii. So. You know, when you're, when you're eight hours from the mainland, that's about as far as you can go. And somehow he managed to get players from our state of Florida out to the mainland. That's like a it's like a 40-hour plane ride. It literally, everybody's on the plane for 40 hours. Brothers that have probably never been, brothers have probably never been outside of Broward County in their life. He convinced them to go on a plane for 40 hours. There's no doubt about it. Hey, listen. Dude ain't been, dude ain't been south of Plantation, and Coach Demo convinced him to go all the way out to Hawaii. Well, he, he can tell us how he did that one day, but I'm going to yeah. let you take over things from here, Fish, because I'm just making fun of him now. Well, we, he basically would tell all the kids that it was like Miami. And, you know, when they got out there, they – you know, there was palm trees and the weather was nice and, you know, the girls were good looking and they believed in it. Yeah, they even told him it was better than, uh, you know, Miami. So, you know, Demo's a great salesman, man. He could sell ice to an Eskimo. And, you know, honestly, that's what made him such a great recruiter. And, uh, you know, you know, he sold me. We've been friends a long time, you know. So, you know, yeah. he sold me a long time ago. But uh, I'm excited to have him on. And this is probably, you know, hopefully becomes like a weekly thing. Until he gets, uh, he's like, oh, man, I don't want to do many more of these podcasts. But uh, he's going to be one of the new co-hosts uh, on the show. And uh, I really enjoy it, man. We need another voice. And who's better than uh, old Demo? So, how you doing, Demo? Hey, I'm doing good. It's always be on, great to be on with, like I said before, with guys that are very knowledgeable about recruiting, especially in Florida, which is a very hot spot. But I enjoy, you know, chopping it up with you guys and talking about football and recruiting and different aspects of the of the game. And I really enjoy it. You know, Dima, the one thing, you know, this time of year we're starting, a, you know, you have the you know teams going into, um, you know, workouts and soon they're going to be doing spring football. But after spring football, one of the things you really enjoy doing was coming down for spring football. And you, you, you brought this up uh, before the show. How much of an impact, you know, the, the NCA decided to move uh, the dead period back to June 1st. What type of impact do you think this will have? You know, it's already had an impact on the 2021 class. Now you're going into another season 2022 recruiting class. What are coaches going to be able to do uh, without the spring evaluations two years in a row? What type of impact do you think it will have not only on the coaches but the seniors who graduate? Um, what will college football look like in the next couple of years? Your opinion on this? Well, I, I'll say this, Fish. It is really has damaged the two senior classes, the one that just graduated and the one that's coming up, because I really enjoyed it. And really, w- w- my base of my work was done in the last two weeks of April and the whole month of May. You know, not only for the kids that were have already been signed to go back and see them, but also, you know, continue to compile that list of the younger kids that you watch in practice. So without that being done, 
And as you said, the NCAA came out and said we're moving a dead period to June 1st. Now that wipes away two years of recruiting for these uh, seniors in high school. So what's happening now is where are these college coaches turning to? The transfer portal. The transfer portal to college coaches now is becoming like NFL free agency. That's what it's becoming. And so who's it damaging? It's the damaging the kids coming out of high school. Because what the coaches are saying is it's easy to evaluate a kid that's already played college sport, a game against other college kids than it is to evaluate a high school kid. Like, and I'm not talking about the five-star kid that's a bona fide player everybody wants. I'm talking about a kid that's trying to earn a scholarship. It's really damaged and hurt him. But this transfer portal thing has got to be really looked at because especially for the new programs, because they're taking they're taking anywhere between 10 to 15 kids off the transfer portal and trying to replace them on their staff. But I, I say it's not only it's not only the ones that they take off the transfer portal, but it's look, look at the ones they put on the transfer portal. I spoke to coaches from other schools, uh, Corey and Fish, that say, hey, man, thank God we got rid of this kid. And the other coach that, that the kids go into school saying, oh, my God, thank God we got this kid. So it's really, uh, you know, it's really becoming a damper, I think, particularly in high school recruiting. When you follow that up, you know, so many coaches, the first thing they always come in and you hear the same thing from every coach. We got to change the culture. We got to change the culture. The reason this team was losing, a lot of times you hear from coaches, uh, you know, it's always, I've always learned that a lot of coaches like downplay a roster. And then when the roster d does well, they're like, hey, well, you know what? We were the reason why they won. We coached them up knowing darn well that the talent was already there. But, you know, what type of, what does it do to a locker room where, you know, here you are, you're a kid that, you know, came in as a freshman or a sophomore, and now the, this school brings in seniors and juniors that take your job. And you've been there for two years doing the off-season workouts and all of the things that they've asked, and now you think it's your time. What, what, what do you think it will start to do to, to these locker rooms, you know, in the future? Well, a lot of times these coaches come in to take over a new program. Why? Because it has failed. Very rarely does the coach come in to take over a program and somebody successful left to another program. It does happen, but most likely he's becoming because a place has failed. So that guy's going to come in. He's going to change everything around, change the staff, change everything around. And then lo and behold, now with this transfer portal, he can wipe half the team out and say, 25 kids, jump on the transfer portal and get out of here because I'm replacing you guys with my players. Although they won't say that, but behind closed doors, that's exactly what's happening. That's why I say, look at the people they put on the transfer portal, not, not only about the people they've taken off the transfer portal and added addition to their teams. So they, don't forget, these guys are getting paid four, five, six million dollars a year. They, and, 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 and their fan base wants success now. They don't want to wait four or five years from now. That's why this transfer portal is really helping these guys that come over and took over new programs to completely revamp their, their roster. And, and, and bring them with kids that, see, I have no problem when a kid goes to school for three years, graduates, and then he becomes a graduate transfer. I, I, I really believe in that. But this transfer portal where a guy goes to a school for a year or two and realizes, I made a mistake, I'm not going to play here, I don't like this coach, I don't like this place, I want to get out of here. And then he goes to another school that maybe recruited him and didn't get him when, they, when he came out. So it's really becoming something. But I think in the long run, it's going to hurt because it's going to be a turnover every two years. Every year is going to be a turnover. Instead of taking this high school kid that you developed for four years and make him into a player, you're going to be this like NFL free agency. So, are, I mean, in your, in, your, in your estimation, are we looking at potential transfer portal regulation? Maybe we're going to regulate how many players off the portal teams can take. We're going to regulate – how kids get on the portal, figuring that, you know, obviously if there's a coaching change, you might have a little bit of leniency there, but in other cases, you know, it just feels like, you know, I, I understood why the NCAA did it. I don't think it's a bad idea on the surface, but, you know, as you see right now, it just, it leads to a lot of things. And I, you know, well, you know, I really feel for, I feel for, you know, I tend to feel for like the mid-majors, you know, especially the mid-major. If you like, you know, you happen to jump on a kid that, you know, is an NFL kid that might have been a little under-recruited. Say, like, say, for instance, would Buffalo have a shot at holding on to Khalil Mack for three years now? I mean, he could go dominate the Mack for a year, you know, decide that after four games next year to redshirt, just hit the portal and go to Miami or go to Alabama or wherever. It just feels like, there's going to be no reward for, you know, these, these mid-major schools finding talent and developing them. Well, I always thought this was a saying, abuse leads to restrictions. And I think when they first put this out, they all thought it was a great idea. 
But now I think it's being abused, especially by some of these coaches that just come over and take over a program, wipe off half their roster and bring in kids off the transfer portal. Oh, because they're recruiting the transfer portal like they should be recruiting high school seniors. That's what they do. But you're exactly right. Some of these smaller schools will be farm systems for the bigger programs. They'll take a kid in that probably wasn't ready coming out of senior year in high school. He gets into a program. He develops for a year or two. He becomes a player. And then he wants to jump to a power five school. That's where I think there's got to be some restrictions that are going to come out soon with the transfer portal. Just like, for instance, this year, you know, the NCAA said, OK, because of the COVID, we're going to do away with SAT, ACT. We're not going to do the 16 core. We're going to do the 10 core. And they have to have so many done by the time they're senior and they only have to have a two, three. Well, that that was a change. But I think they're going to go back to it um, unless you're an early, early enrollee next year. After that, they're going to go back to the normal rules. So I think that's what they did with the transfer portal. Initially, like you said, making it a, a good idea to be able to do it with, with good intentions, but it's turned out to be something different than that. Yeah, you know, Corey and I have had this, you know, we discussed it. My biggest issue is what happens if there's a Josh Allen out of Wyoming, Khalil Mack? You had Eric Fisher, who was the first pick over all of the draft from Central Michigan. These teams, they find these kids, and all of a sudden you have coaches going behind – team's backs and recruiting these kids I, I just think it, you're gonna have a mess uh, you start you you're gonna create a problem I think you got to get to the point where almost like I still think they got to go back to hey if you're gonna transfer you got to sit out a year you know like you shouldn't just be able to be eligible unless there's the whole purpose of the transfer uh, originally was that a kid got closer to home a family member got sick it wasn't hey I mean you see Justin Fields. Justin Fields transfers to Ohio State. He's eligible right away. Tate Martell. And these kids are making up reasons. Let's be honest. They're making up reasons so they could go play right away. Well, that I, I just think it causes a major problem. And you're gonna you're gonna start to see pro you want to talk about culture in a locker room. I just think if you take too many of these kids, you're gonna ruin the culture of the locker room. It's NFL free agency. I don't mind NFL free agency when the guys are making a million dollars a year. You're trying to build your team that way. But we're talking the livelihood of, of juniors and seniors in high school that are working their rear ends off to try to earn scholarships to go to school. And they're being looked over by the transfer portal because it's a quick fix. It's, a, it's, a, it's an easy way to fix your program. Instead of building your program up over time, you're going to have to keep building it up. But the key to it is I enjoyed as a coach going out in the month of April and May recruiting and really evaluate these kids and find out not only athletically how good they are and academically, but how they are as a person, how they fit into your program. I enjoyed that part of it, getting to know the young man, getting to know his family, okay? And I, as many times as you're allowed out is, is, is what I did. The it, last two years, it's been done away with. So now I know why they're using a the transfer portal the way they are. But like you said, I think it's going to be reverse effect. It's going to cause a riff in a locker room after a while. Where's he coming from? Where, how come he ahead of me? I was ahead of him. Instead of letting kids come in and earn their way through the program, kids are coming in off the transport portal thinking they should be playing right away. And maybe they should be. But the, the, the thing I liked is when, okay, you have to go to the school and graduate. After you've gone there three years and you graduated, then you could do what Russell Wilson did, be a graduate transfer, or, or the guy that went to Oklahoma uh, from, um, from Alabama. Th those guys, I, they, they went there. They, they, they served their time, so to speak. They graduated. And now they can say, OK, I want to go take my thing as a graduate transfer somewhere else. That's what I truly believe in, because I think you're getting a better player. Yeah, I just I'm not into it. I, I just think personally, like I said, a lot of these kids, you go look. I think the numbers they said, I think we looked it up out of like 17 or 1800 kids that have gone into the transfer portal. I think only 250 have actually signed with the new school. So it, it just tell one, I think it creates something you're telling kids hey listen if it's not working out after a year let's quit that's not part of football that's not something you know you learn from coach Bowden. and it's not what uh, a lot of the great coaches whether it's beamer whether it's a lot of the great coaches uh tom osborne they didn't teach that hey listen when it's tough let's let's just bail out and that's they've given these kids a reason to just bail out that the first sign of, hey, we're not going to play as a freshman. And the reality is most kids shouldn't play as freshmen. They just it's shouldn't. not just the players, though. Let's not sit around here and make this a player's issue. Coaches are coaches are getting bailed out of recruiting mistakes as well by doing this. They're doing it. Got it. They're just, as, they're just as culpable as players are, if not more, because they're basically saying after a year, you know what, This I don't feel like developing this kid. This kid's yep. not exactly what I thought he would be. I don't really, you know, maybe all he can do is help us on special teams, you know, get him on the portal, get rid of him. 
So you, well, you, it used to be tough to tell a kid, hey, listen, you got to leave. There was a process to it. Now the portal gives them, hey, an excuse. All they have to do is put the kid forth on the depth chart. The kid's like looking at that depth chart every day. The coach doesn't have to say anything. You know, put them behind two walk-ons. The kid's going to realize, oh, man, I'm never going to see the field. Oh, I'm in the portal. Corey's 100% right. It starts with the coaches. It starts with the coaches saying, okay, we made a mistake in recruiting. Get rid of this kid. What? Can you imagine if the kids say, I'm good enough. I don't want to play for you anymore. I'm, getting, I'm going somewhere else. That's what's happening. Yeah. You know, and, and, and but he's right. It's up to the coaches. And I say it's not just what the coaches are taking off the portal. Look at the amount of players they're putting on a portal because they made mistakes. Or they're blaming it on the previous staff. They made mistakes. So we're wiping out our roster. We're getting rid of all these kids. What about family? What about love? What about all this stuff these guys <laughs> preach? You know what I'm saying? Where is that stuff? It's only when it's convenient for you to love a kid. What if it's that? What if it's your kid you're telling him going to transport? Well, we've researched this kid. He's bad academically. He's a bad person. He's not following our rules. He's not showing up in the weight room. They're just making stuff up so you can throw a kid on the portal. It's ridiculous. Team, I want to ask you a question. You've been on multiple staffs, whether it's at FSU, NC State, Rutgers. You know, how I know there's guys that develop. Andre Wadsworth was one of those guys that he was like 215 pounds and he became a different player after a couple of years. How quickly do you realize that a kid's a mistake? Like when, how long after they're on campus, do you realize you watch them practice and say, oh man, man, we may have made a mistake here. And that kid, you kind of shun away from him because you know, he can't play and coaches kind of, you know, it's just, it's human nature. You know, it's like, all right, you, you know, that's just what some people do. What do you, what do you think about that? I think, you know, instantly. And that's just the way I am as a coach. I used to be able to de develop kids. And what's happening now is that when they've made a mistake on a kid because they want to impress the head coach and recruit this kid so they can impress the head coach, and head coach is saying, yeah, we'll take this kid. And then he turns out to be a flop. Well, I tell kids this. Make sure you research that university. Research that position coach. Because that position coach, to me, is the most important person to develop that young man. Not the head coach. Not anybody else besides the strength coach. And I think you have a little segment on that later. But your position coach that you go to that school for, that you commit and you go there, you better make sure you research that guy. How long is he going to be there? Is he good at developing players? Can he relate to me? So when you go on recruiting trips to the schools and the guy recruiting you isn't your position coach, you better search that guy out and make sure you know who he is. Who was the best strength coach you ever found yourself working around, whether it was as a player, whether it was a GA, as a coach, who was the strength coach that all you looked at that really stuck out to you as a guy that, you know, made a difference and really, you know, help put a better team out on the field? Well, that's a great question, you know, because I've been around some pretty good ones. But they definitely and, – and it's hard to answer that question, Corey. I'm, you asked me, and I'm kind of – I kind of thrown back a little bit because it's hard to answer that question because I've been around some good ones. But what you have to understand about strength coaches, they're an extension of the head coach. And they're an extension, just like I talked about the position coach. Better, You better make sure if you're playing linebacker, secondary, whatever, that position coach is pretty good. You better make sure when you go to that school, that strength coach is too. Because now it encompasses everything. Speed, strength, nutrition, stretching ability, leadership. That's where all these kids learn all that stuff down in the weight room, you know, in the off-season program. Because as they say, the strength coach spends just as much, if not more time than the players, than the regular coaches do. So to me... It's a very vital hire for you. A lot of guys say it's the next hire, the first hire I do, et cetera, et cetera. But I also see guys make mistakes on those guys too, and it costs them. You know, sometimes they become too motherly with these kids. Sometimes, they, you know, you need to be there for them and give them a hug, but you also need to develop them, down in the weight room especially. And part of it is discipline and getting after them. So that guy's got to be a good leader amongst all the other things that I talked about. Yeah, you know, there's some great, you know, strength coaches out there. One that gets a lot of recognition is, you know, Tommy Moffitt. He coached at uh, Tennessee back, I think, when they won the title with T. Martin and them. Then he goes to Miami, uh, went, you know, helps build that program with Butch Davis, goes to LSU uh, and helped build that program with Saban. And now, uh, you know, they've won multiple national championships. He had a guy that came off of his group, uh, Cochran, who was at uh, – um, Alabama now's uh, assistant coach at UGA. What makes these guys so important? Like, you know, you saw when you guys got to Rutgers, Rutgers, that's one thing I thought, you know, when I remember going out and watching them the first time. And, I, and, and at that time, Florida State wasn't that good. And I remember one of my friends said, oh, what do you think? And I go, 
your guys look better than Florida State's right now. And he thought I was crazy. And that's the one thing when you guys got to Rutgers, you turned boys into men. I mean, it, it the, the transition of what guys look like when they first got there. I mean, you you remember Marcus Force and you guys had you guys took a defensive tackle out of Miramar who ended up they were the same body types almost, but he ended up better. And it's because he went like your strength program at the time, honestly, was better than Miami's. Well, not only is is the is the strength the head strength coach important, but who does he hire under him? Who are the three or four or five assistants that he hires under him? Are they just as good? They work just as hard. Do they have a credibility, et cetera, et cetera? Because they, 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 the head strength coach can't coach all 80 kids at once. So he has to break them down into other assistants that's in that room. So they have to be just as viable as him. When I was at Florida State, we had Dave Van Allinger. And Dave, you know, went to, went to Georgia with Mark Rick. But he had a bunch of assistants that worked with him that were very good. When I was at NC State, the guy Todd Stroud was a Florida State guy, and CJ Hunter and all these other guys, they ran NC State's weight room. Okay, very, very important. Then I go up to Rutgers, it was that guy Butler. Now, again, he has four or five assistants, now six. I don't even know how many let him hire now, as many as they want, as long as they have the money and the budget for it. They hire hundreds of them, and they're all over the place. They're, I call them They're all over the place. They have nutrition now. They have all this stuff. So it's very, very important to a program that you take a kid, and, and, and see, this goes back to the transfer portal. You take a kid when he's a freshman. You take three or four years to develop him. By the time he's a junior and senior, he turns out to be the player you thought he was going to be. You know, so you have to be able to have that development down in the weight room, but it encompasses everything. I mean, now it's you got a speed coach, you got the nutritionist, you got the, the strength guy, you got a person who does the flexibility. But that's where leadership from your football team is developed down in the weight room. You guys were the first. I, I remember going to one of the Rutgers camp and, and Corey, you'll laugh about this. Rutgers had like names for guys like assistant, you know, head chef, like the guy probably never been in a kitchen in his life but they needed an extra straight coach. They had so many of these guys every year that would get off the bus. There'd be like 20 of them. But I, it, you saw the results of like how important those coaches were, not only to the staff, but, you know, they, they're so involved. I've talked to strength coaches. They're, you know, they're the ones that deal with the guy when he's having issues with a the girlfriend. They're, having, they're, they're so involved. They're almost like a therapist for these kids, not just a strength coach. But that's why I wanted to bring it up because so many people think, oh, you know what, like it's not that important. And a lot of coaches, honestly, I've talked to a lot of co coaches that have hired guys. It is one of the first guys they hired. And that's why it's so important because if they make the wrong hire on that strength coach, they end up getting fired. You know, it's that big of a deal. I mean, Urban Meyer, look, I mean, he was willing. We, we talked about this on a podcast a couple of weeks ago. He was willing to deal with all the blowback of this guy from Iowa because he was such a good straight coach that he didn't care. You know, that's 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 how important these guys are to programs and also NFL teams. Well, first, I'll say one more thing. It goes back to recruiting now. You got to know how to recruit a kid that's going to be able to go down in that weight room and do the things necessary that you want him to do to become developed. OK, it goes back to understanding the kid through the recruiting process. As you're recruiting this kid, you know how your strength coach is. You know how tough the weight room is. You know what they have to do down there to become great leaders. As you're recruiting a kid, you're saying to yourself, will that kid do what's necessary to do in the weight room to develop and be the kid that I think he can be? So it's, recruiting is very important. It, it goes back to saying, can this kid fit into our program, not only on the football field, not only academically, but in the weight room as well? That's where he develops most of his time. Yeah. I, you know, one last thing, Corey, and I'm going to jump in. I, I remember talking to Vic Valoria. He was the head strength coach at Florida State when Jimbo got there. He he also came up from the Moffitt trees, now to LSU again. I think he ended up getting hired at either Baylor or one of the other programs. You know, I remember talking to him, and Corey will remember this kid. There was a kid, Toshman Stevens, that Jimbo took a flyer on early. I think he was like 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, like 210. And I remember – Not really, brother. What? He was, he was he was recruiting 210. He was about a buck 95. Right. I, I just remember talking to Vic, and he's like, you know, the one thing he told Jimbo was, listen, I could get weight on that kid, but by the time I get weight on him, it's going to be three, four years down the road. Get me bigger guys that I could put weight on, and they put on weight, and it, it looks different, you know? And they started recruiting a different – you know, you got to recruit guys that could put on the weight. You look at D Lyman, you want wide bodies on D tackles. If a guy has narrow hips – and narrow shoulders, he's not going to get – you could put get a guy to get up to 300. He's still going to look 285, 
and he's never going to have that power in his base. And, and that's so important too. That's what a lot of these strength coaches tell me, Hey, I need certain type of guys to do what I need to do. Coach, I wanted to ask you before, we, who were some of the players that you coached that you were around in your programs that really, that really set the example in the weight room that really, you know, that really were, were kind of the, uh, you know, were kind of the examples that you want when you talk about how important the strength coaches, the kids that you saw that did the work every day that really, that it really showed up on the football field. Well, when you go down in that weight room, you have to bring energy. You have, there has to be energy in that weight room. There has to be juice in that weight room. And that's why these strength coaches are hired because they got the energy and they got the juice. And then when you talk about kids that you've been around, the kid, there are weight room kids, okay? There are kids that go in the weight room and just dominate the weight room. But it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be great players on the field. Just like great players on the field don't necessarily mean they're going to be great ones in the weight room. It, it, it's, it's a combination of things, I think, that makes a great player. It's, you know, process, all that kind of, can he process things quickly, all that kind, kind of stuff like that. But there's been players that I've been around that the weight room has definitely made them better football players. There's no doubt about it. I, I look at a guy like Eric Forster from Homestead, Florida, played for a supper Rutgers, and he's a defensive lineman. He played with the Colts for many years. He was a great developer in the weight room that made that made it, you know. And, I, and there's a lot. Um, Pop Beck, Beckford, uh, another guy from. Um, he was a specimen. He was he played at the Glades, I think, from Glade Central. He played for a separate records. These guys were weight room guys, but they could also transfer what they've done in the weight room to the field. Some guys can't even do that, so so you struggle with that. So wait a minute, you know. But he, he, here's one thing I was going to say, Corey, and it goes back to what Fish said. I have friends that coach all around the country. I speak to a few of them at the smaller schools. And they say, you know, when we recruit this kid out of high school, a smaller schools, Division II, one AA schools, we got to recruit a kid that we project down the line to be a great player. And by the time he's a junior or senior, he is that guy that we thought he was. He grew three inches. He put on 30 pounds. Then what's happening he's worried about is, I do all of this developing for two years with this kid. He becomes a prototype kid where you guys are talking about in the weight room, then he transfers out to Division One school. He jumps on a portal. He's gone. And he's like, I'm starting to be a feeder system for these guys. That's what they're worried about with this portal. Not to get off subject and back on the portal and from the weight room, but that's what they're worried about. And the weight room is a great place to develop character for your football team. But, man, that's got to translate to what they do in the field. And the other part, my, my favorite part of this week is when you get a chance to talk about scouting and evaluating. I love scouting. I love evaluating. I love why. I love why. Part of what we do, and then Fish, you can elaborate on this. Part of what we do when we're at a practice or we're at a game or we're at a scrimmage or whatever is we're jotting down numbers. Boy, if a kid looks good, we're jotting down that number. Then we're going to watch him for about four or five plays, isolate on him, see what we can see. It's the greatest thing. And it's, it's the lifeblood of how a program is success. You don't have a good program unless you can scout and evaluate talent. Am I wrong? No, it's, it's one of the most important things is being able to evaluate. And um, that's why this next subject is great because at, you've been on the message boards, Corey, and, and one, there's one name, you know, there's about four or five that are legends in the uh, annals of Florida State recruiting. And one of them was Deshaun Platt who came out of, I believe Charlotte High School, he played for Old Vicky. And at that time, Deshaun was supposed to be the next Peter Wark. And I think people still make jokes on message boards about him showing up and playing. But at that point, um, Coach Dima was at NC State, and he liked somebody better. He liked a guy named Richard Washington who came out of, I believe, uh, North Fort Myers or South Fort – I think North Fort Myers High School. North Fort Myers, yeah. Fort, Fort Myers High School. And Richard ended up not only having – he made the eval and made the right eval. He not only made the right evaluation on him, the kid ended up having a great career. But what I like about the Richard Washington story is Demo always, no matter where he was, he always liked the challenge of going after a top recruit. Now, Richard was down to two schools. He was down to Ohio State and NC State. Not really. It was Ohio State, Florida, and NC State. All right. Well, Demo shouldn't even have been in the conversation. No. But he got in the conversation, and Richard, you know, you know, like got to like Demo just like we like him. But Demo, tell us a little bit about the evaluation, why you liked him a little more than Deshaun Platt at the time. But tell us like how that process happened. What happened with you guys in Ohio State at Richard's house? 
give the fans a little bit of the recruiting backstory of the days of recruiting Richard Washington. All right. Richard Washington was, first of all, a special player. And there's, there's no reason why he was a highly recruited kid. I mean, Florida State was in on him, Ohio State, Florida. They were close enough between Fort Myers and where in Charlotte, where um, where Deshaun went to, that I was going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, evaluating the heck out of him, watching him in practice, taking notes, checking him out as a kid. What 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 drove this kid? What made him great? What 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 was going to push this kid to to the next level? Who, who who was better, this guy or that guy? Then I would bring down the head coach at the time, Chuck Amata. We went back and forth, and and we both sit down and said. This is the guy we got to go after, Richard Washington. Let's get him. Now, it was a foregone conclusion to people that he was going to Ohio State. And that was it. And, and, and they had already committed there. You know, his head high school coach was an old, old coach for a long time down there in the, in the Fort Myers area. OK, I got to know him a little bit and I got to know his son a little bit. They both coached Richard. So they told me he was up in the air. And if you could change him, go ahead. If not, then, you know, he's probably going to go ahead to go to Ohio State. So I continue to work him and work him and work him and call him and, and tell him how special he was. And when we made that decision to, to not recruit Deshaun Platt, to go with Richard, that's when I started the full court press on Richard. And what happened was he had already committed. So I knew I had my work cut out for me uh, with Ohio State. So I was down there at a home visit one time. This is a true story. I mean, you, you know, you know. So I'm over their house. They live in a two two level apartment house. Outside was a little balcony. I went into the, I went into the house. I met Richard and his mom. We sat down and we were talking. Lo and behold, I was supposed to be there for a half. I was there for hours. You know, I just didn't leave. You know, and there's a knock at the door, and it's Ohio State coaches. They're all they're all out there knocking. Like three of them, they're in their ties and all that. They're knocking at the door, and Miss Washington said, "I ain't opening that door." Richard said, "I'm not going to answer that door." So there they are out there. They're knocking away. So I proceed to continue to talk to Richard and his mom. His mom's starting to cook a little something. She asked me, do I like some, some fried chicken? I said, absolutely. So she starts to cook <laughs> some ch fried chicken for me. All of a sudden, Richard goes into this one room, and he comes out, and he's head to toe in NC State stuff. He goes, Coach Demo, I want to let you know I'm going to NC State, and I'll see you later. I'm like, where's he going? He slides open the balcony door on the second floor, jumps out, and takes off running, and he's gone. So now I'm sitting in there with Richard's mom and I'm saying, what are we going to do about these guys out in the, on, a, on, a, on a patio on the second floor? So she goes, I'm going to call my husband. So she calls the husband who's working at a gas station down the street. He comes back, passes those guys in the, in, in the little ledge, comes into the apartment. And she goes, Richard decided he's going to NC State. And that's it. He goes, that's it. So he goes back out there. And I hear these guys on the phone with Trestle. Hey, they're not letting us in. I know some guy from NC State's in there. They're not letting us in. What are we going to do? He's already committed to us. You guys stay, you know. So there's like three of them out there. So he goes back out there and says, guys, listen, I know you had an appointment with us, but my son's made his decision. He's going to go to NC State. And that's it. Oh, they were mad. They want to they, 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 we get in there. We want to talk to his mom. Yeah, blah, blah. That's it. Bang, close the door. His dad come back in. We sat down. We had a little, little glass of beer. We had some fried chicken. We enjoyed the rest of the night. And that's how I got Richard Washington. <laughs> True I, love, story. I love that story. Hey, Corey, when Demo's really out of coaching and we're all retired, we'll tell the real story. <laughs> the, the now, now, listen, I'll tell you this one. Okay, so that so he committed to me. But the next week, he goes to visit Florida, University of Florida. And they come down with the private jet. They fly him up there. I'm like, oh, man, I can't believe this. Well, he comes back from the from Florida trip. He calls me. He says, coach. No problem. Still coming to NC State. And sure enough, we were waiting for that letter to come across the fax machine that on signing day. And sure enough, it came across. Was that uh, was that Florida? Was that Zook's uh, staff at Florida? I think it was Zook's staff. Okay. Yes, Corey. All right. Yeah. So he that, beat out Zook and Tressel, Corey. Beat out Zook and Tressel. My question to you is when you're looking at, you know, looking at these two players, Deshaun Platt, who I still think is a myth. I don't think he really exists. But y'all can tell me otherwise. <laughs> You say you're evaluating. What are you evaluating? When people want to know, what are you evaluating when you're looking at these two very similar, very talented players? Are you looking at their fit in your program? Are you looking at their fit as a player in general? What exactly are you looking at? Or all the different elements. What are you looking at? Corey, I know they were both great athletes, and they both had great highlight films, and they both did great things on the field. But what I kept saying to myself, who's going to fit in in front of 80,000 people and when the spotlight's on, they're not going to flinch. They're just going to go out there and do it. And I kept going back to Richard because he had that little swag, which I liked. He had that little attitude, like, I'm not going to be stopped. It don't matter who's going to be around me, near me, whatever. I'm going to get it done. 
I knew he had Philip Rivers as the quarterback at NC State that was going to get him the ball. Okay. I knew he's a good returner, special teams guy, which we needed. And I kept going back to him. And I said, he fits that criteria. He fits that evaluation. He fits that mold. And, and nothing wrong with Deshaun. He just don't fit what I'm looking for. Richard fit everything I was looking for. And, and then that's kind of how it started and developed. And I watch his mannerisms at practice. I watch him how he interacted with other kids. I watch him when the coach coached him hard. Did he act like he had all the answers or did he listen and comprehend and try to go out and do what he was asking? Even though he was a great talent and he really didn't need nobody to tell him what to do. He still he took the coaching and was very important to me. Oh, man. I, like I said, those are my favorite stories talking to you. And uh, it's great. And I'm sure there's plenty of others that will go over oh. in the future. But, um, Corey, we're going to have one final segment on the other side. And uh, it's story time with Demo and uh, his time at Rutgers. And this I, this is one of my favorite stories of his. And, and uh, I think you'll like it too, man. So you, you got to come back for this one. As many schools as Coach Demo has worked at over the years, he's got plenty of stories, and we're always good for hearing one. What's our story going to be about today, Demo? Well, Fish, you want to lead into it? Fish? Yeah, I'll jump into it. So, you know, Demo goes to Rutgers, and, and you know, I'm not going to lie. Like, when they used to come down for their satellite camps, the first year I remember Greg would put up video, and there was like three plays on the highlight video. It was like a three-play highlight video. <laughs> that's, you know, that's how bad Rutgers was. But they started to turn it around, and they had a big game uh, against Boston College. Was it on the road, team? I think it was on the road up at Chestnut Boston Hill. College, yeah. So, Corey, he gets them ready for the game, and Demo's got you know his guys ready. And he could kind of go into the story from here about what happened and, and, and going into that game and, and because they thought they had a great shot at winning. So, Demo, tell us, tell us about the story about Boston College and what happened. Well, first thing I want to tell the people is that in, in an entire football game, there's probably three or four plays that determine the game. You know, you, you go through, you know, 75, 80 plays on offense, defense, number of plays on special teams. But three or four plays when you're going back and forth with a team usually comes down to, to decide the game. And then there's momentum. When a play happens, you're either, you know as a coach, oh, man, we're done. Or you just put the dagger in us. Or you got a chance to recover from that mistake that was made. So. Here I am at Rutgers coming from Florida State, North Carolina State, my home state, New Jersey. And it's the first season I'm at Rutgers. I think we got a 500 season. Maybe we're four and five or three and six or whatever we are. But we're going up to play BC at BC. Big East game. We're in the Big East. They're in the Big East. So we're going up to Boston to play BC. And I think their starting linebacker played a Bergen Catholic. Uh, I think his father was Toll. He was starting linebacker. Whatever. So there was a bunch of stuff going on in that game. But it came down to this play early in the second quarter, maybe. So the, we're fighting for our lives to stay in the game, and we're doing a pretty good job of it. Well, our quarterback goes back to pass, and they zone blitz us. They drop their defensive end, which they usually been bringing. And I can't remember his name, Asimao, something like that, played with the um, Giants, okay? But he was a senior at BC at the time. So he's playing left defensive end, and he's coming off the edge, coming off. The, they zone blitz on this play. They drop him into coverage. Quarterback doesn't recognize it. Bam, throws him the ball, and he goes back 20 yards and scores. And at the time, I said, that's it. We're done. <laughs> oh, you can't say that, Demo. You can't. I'm like, no, listen, I know. You know, there's certain times <laughs> in the game when you know that's it. The momentum is swung. They took it out of us, and that is it. And I don't want to get an embarrassing who the quarterback was or this guy that or whatever. But the bottom line is that's just how it goes. And there's certain plays within the game that you know as a coach, that's it. You don't say that outwardly. Sometimes you might just say it inwardly, even though your kids are fighting, you teach them to fight to the end of the game and all that great stuff and all that good stuff. But three or four plays determine it. There's a, usually a dagger or two in the game. Can your kids recover from it? And you got to know that as a coach. And at that point I said, oh boy, you know, we're kind of in trouble. But here's the thing about recruiting. And, and I'll finish with this. The biggest thing in recruiting is what's called process. Can someone process information quickly and get it done? The game of football is played at an extremely fast level, very, very fast. If you're sitting in the stands, then you go down and watch a Power 5 team play, an SEC team, and you're on a sideline, that game's flying 100 miles an hour. Now, what makes Tom Brady so great is how quickly he processes information. They might be showing this coverage, but they rotate to this. Or they're playing this leverage, and they jump inside, then they jump outside. He can process it so quickly and get the ball where it's supposed to be 
That's what makes a great player. And the same thing as a defensive player, when he's playing leverage, inside leverage, out, I'm going to show him pre-snap inside, I'm going to jump to outside. All those different kinds of things go on in a game. It's so subtle to the naked eye, and it's so subtle that that's what triggers great players is how quickly they process. And a lot of tag words go into certain things that you see. So you might say to yourself, oh, a team's playing cover two the whole game. No, they're not. They're doubling this guy. Or this guy's playing outside leverage. Where's my help? I don't have help. This guy has contained. No, now this guy has contained. So there's a lot of different things to the naked eye that you don't see that's going on in the football game. Or you might, from the regular person, say, oh, they're just playing 4-3, cover two the whole game. No, they're not. They're doing a lot of different things. But the process thing, uh, going back to what you asked me about, Richard, being able to process stuff quickly, especially at the quarterback position, is a very, very important uh, attribute. Well, Timo, this was a great uh, intro to uh, what we're going to bring in the future. We actually – uh, dropped out a segment uh, that I want to talk about on our next show. We're going to have coach talk and you're going to go into uh, some of the different coverages and stuff that you taught and why some coverages work at some schools and maybe not at others. That's something I think the fans will definitely be interested in, but you know, we're glad to have you on and look forward to having you back, uh, you know, next week. And um, I think this is going to be a, a, a great relationship uh, on, on the fish cast. And uh, what do you think, Corey? I love it. You know, I could spend hours talking to Coach Demo. I have spent hours talking to Coach Demo. I now get to spend more hours talking to Coach Demo. So, not a bad thing at all for me. And you know, Charles, I'll always hang out with you. And God knows, here's the thing that people don't know. Once you stop hitting record, that's when all the fun really starts. That's when you can talk about <laughs> real stuff. Uh, listen, if I ever put like uh, stuff out there, that uh, I've edited. Uh, I think the people would enjoy that a lot more, but I'm trying to, <laughs> you know, we can't do that. We can't do it. But I, I had a great time today. And, and like I said, look forward to this uh, new uh, setup that we have here. And um, for those that want to, you know, follow us, you can follow us on, uh, you know, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. We're on SoundCloud. We're on every single platform that you can have. And uh, it's gone great in a very relatively short time. And uh, Demo, look forward to talking to you next week. And also, Corey, same to you, man. I'm out. Corey Fish, thank you. Take it easy.